Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Sean, Dr. Sean Lenehan from uh, Australia. Has anyone had the, uh, a chance to look at this book yet? Only Jared. It was made available for free on the uh, MAPS website um, of the actual conference. Um, there's a link you can just click and actually receive the whole thing, which is a 10-year dissertation um, that I've done at Sydney University in Australia. I'll just see how it goes. Is that? Yeah. Sorry, guys. We're actually giving a talk now. So. <coughs> um, has anyone ever read any phenomenology? Yes, a little bit. Um, <coughs> it's actually. Is that, that might not be easier. It, um, it's actually very difficult to try and explain this approach to studying human beings in a few minutes. Um, and the best I think I can do uh, within half an hour duration is give the paper and, um, and see where the, uh, the dialogue takes us in our understanding. What I've included up there is just a selection of some of the references to the phenomenological movement. Um, including, you just want to pass them around. Oh, sure. including um, a number of excerpts from the instructors um, that I'm taught by, um, and cross-cultural uh, studies of this kind. So <clears throat> I'll go through the paper, and uh, please just ask whatever you want um, about the approach. Um, and we'll see uh, what it has to contribute to uh, to our understanding of psychedelic science. <clears throat> this paper develops material from ethnographic research undertaken into clubs and raves in Sydney. Rather than seeking to compress my larger monograph the varieties of ecstasy experience into a short talk, I will develop a number of insights from this work with further theoretical augmentation. This work was exploratory in nature as the ethnography and the subsequent interpretations were generated within the duration of the fieldwork and the write-up. Essentially, what this methodology and theoretical interpretations of this project of knowledge sought to clarify and illuminate the social cultural worlds of drug consumers. Although this orientation is complementary to interdisciplinary concerns, this position rejects all biological reductionism scientistic, objectivistic, or mechanistic paradigms, all of which argue that living organisms are determined by the brain. In the ethnographic context, the main orientation is to strive to maximally open oneself up to other people's experience, taking their experience to the best of one's ability on their own terms, and thus allowing them to become palpable. Given the persuasive use of ecstasy in Australia and abroad, it Research which focuses on users' own self-reports internally can contribute to an understanding of these substances by generating insights into the varieties of ecstasy experiences and that participants undergo in the course of ecstasy use. Hence, the focus on ecstasy consumers' own self-reports can provide direct insights into the interpretations, affects, desires, motivations, meanings, in fact, the entire social cultural horizons of these people's existence that is generated in and through what they say and do. Phenomenology is that science that is an approach to the intentional life of consciousness, and knowledge that starts with an acute examination and description of human experiential stream and its articulation, i.e. the field of human subjectivity. When applied to the ethnographic project, phenomenology is in an excellent position to record and clarify human experience. The value of this approach is that it directly attunes to users' experiences, their internal flux of intentional movements of consciousness. This is the alternative to the deterministic mechanistic argument. To attune to people's own experiences, I adopted <coughs> Strauss's dialogue of phenomenology, which enabled me to frame and critically re reflect on my informants' accounts of their own experiences within their respective social cultural contexts. Just, just there? Right. Thank you very much. 
In the ethnographic context, the main orientation of dialogal approach is to open oneself up to other people's experience, taking their experience to the best of one's ability on their own terms and allowing them to become more palpable. In this respect, the researcher strives to describe how the people exactly as they appear to his or her consciousness. Hence, rather than thinking about the underlying mechanisms of neurological action, they are often central to the polemic debate surrounding ecstasy use and its supposed toxicity. What interested me was an open-minded ethnographic exploration of ecstasy use, directly grounded in the user's own experiences with these substances. The examples presented in this paper are drawn from a larger corpus of interviews, notes, and conversations with informants. To give the reader a sense of this lived dynamic trajectory of ecstasy use, I have organized these self-reports into thematic categories that roughly correspond to excerpts from temporal sequence of using ecstasy. The following example illustrates various users' early reactions to ecstasy, the come on, in the first hour of CERM. In the ethnographic encounter, this is described as the intentional movements of consciousness in the experiential stream and articulation. I will try and explain what some of this is, if we have time. <clears throat> so this is a quote from one user who's actually describing their consciousness on the drug. In the beginning, the physical effects of the drug are overpowering. Your heart is beating really fast and you're just trying to breathe and control it all. You go with the pulse and you start breathing a bit harder. In dealing with the common, it's usually better to sit down so that you don't freak yourself out running around. In the second stage, I sit down and have a cigarette. Well, many a cigarette, because sometimes they feel a whole lot better, she laughs. I feel like I hit a state where I sit down and I just feel it. And if sitting next to someone, it is all very touchy. Like I'm sitting to one of them, my next best girlfriends, I always hold her hand. I wish to emphasize that these experiences captured through phenomenological synthesis <coughs> is fragmentary and incomplete. In other words, it represents fragments of the totality of the life of these people as they are interpreting it through their own experiences. The partial insights that I gleaned through the ethnography were, however, truly revelatory, as openly acknowledged that other people's social cultural realities are, are always more than any or all um, any ethnography can actually capture. As argued in this paper, in comparison with more traditional external approaches to drug use, what phenomenological orientation allows is a direct description, recording, and examination of the people on their own terms, allowing us to see, so to speak, inside their own heads, as these people are acting, feeling, thinking, and in specific social cultural contexts, such as Sydney, Australia. This methodology entails a shift from observation to direct, unmediated examination of human experience, wherein the people's lives are taken as independent to the researcher. Thus, in phenomenology, rather than superimposing preconceived frameworks, theories and models onto people, e.g. that the euphoric effects of ecstasy emerge from serotonergic release, this perspective allows the researcher to truly attempt to get under the skin of these people by studying them not as an object to be observed, but as real and independent people whose lives can be grasped, described, and recorded. Thus, the original insights into the lives of these people presented as self-reports can be used to substantiate or invalidate existing empirical data or theoretical concerns. In sum, in this paper, I argue that phenomenological anthropology can contribute to understanding these people in and through their own actions and reflections. These ethnographic descriptions can also serve to contribute to a growing inter interdisciplinary body of scientific knowledge based on giving people that are often marginalized from dominant scientific debates a central place in established academic knowledge. Within the discipline of anthropology, our understanding of human beings must be based on what they say and do. Hence, the direct experiences of these people can serve to highlight the variation in human experience in specific social and historical contexts. Although many astute commentators have described the ineffable and the inexplicable nature of drug-induced or altered states of consciousness, I wholeheartedly embrace Shannon's recent affirmation that empirical studies of these other worlds are not only possible, but highly productive in revealing the actual experiences of the users themselves for further empirical and theoretical analysis. As such, I have argued that phenomenological orientation directly attunes to use self-interpretation 
emergent within their experiences in respect to social contexts of youth can provide an excellent starting point for surveying the varieties of ecstasy experience. So I've kept the paper short so that we can actually have um, a proper um, Q&A discussion. <coughs> Thanks, everyone. So I've just made the book free for, um, through Sydney University digitization. I do understand that um, it's, it's actually very, very difficult. The PhD I was doing went over 10 years. Um, and trying to think about how to compress that into a 15-minute talk sort of was, was, was difficult. So does anyone want to start with uh, some sort of general questions? And we'll take it from there. Yep. Yeah, I have a general question, um, which has been a question on my mind uh, for a long time. Um, It's, it's central. Um, sorry, is it Mark, is it? Or? Mark. Mark. Pleased to meet you, Mark. Um, my instructor, Yadran Mimika, one of his papers is there, um, is one of the few people that actually teaches Hesselian phenomenology in, in anthropology in the world. Um, what this is, you can't sum it up in a nutshell because it, it just can't be done. But if you listen to me before thinking about, they're trying to describe the, the flux right, that is in our subjective experience. And what they're suggesting there is that's not determined by any laws of physics, chemistry, um, or, or biology. Um, and this really is um, a way that we can then become to think about human freedom. Um, it's very, very important. Um, because if we're just thinking of ourselves on the basis of uh, biological machines, which is very common, actually, that's uh, scientism, we can have no way um, of really understanding the human beings that are separate to us on their own terms. So what the phenomenological approach is saying is, I want to suspend the actual scientific worldview that I've learned at university. And I'm going to go into the field with an open mind. And I'm going to take the people on their own terms. Um, and what I find there, I'm going to use that to challenge the Western scientific approach. And what you find is that the actual Western scientific approach doesn't stand up um, very, very much. Um, and that is um, really um, sort of trying to get an understanding of why is it that we've come to think of ourselves at times as actual biologically determined. Or we don't have a sense of ourselves that we're actually directing our own actions. So you might have read some of this, but... If you, if you read some of the phenomenology, they're trying to describe intentionality. Has anyone ever heard of that? Intentionality? Yep. That's self-directedness, literally. Literally. As I'm walking here, that is what they're seeking to describe. Our behavior is directed from the body. So I am Sean. This is how we actually lecture in phenomenology. And this we describe as the life world, literally. So we're taking other human beings and trying to get a sense of what's their world, what's their society, what's their field of action. Sorry, Joe, you want to jump in? Oh, yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, yep. You do a really good job of describing the life world of your population. Yep. And you want to go into more about who these people are, you know, in Sydney, and uh, uh, because that's, yeah, uh, if you go and look at that, you'll see that. But just describe the, the population that you did study in. Convey, you know, in quotes and, uh, okay. Um, it's, it's a random selection of people, really. And uh, I didn't know them. I uh, was studying, uh, you know, as a PhD student, and I went out and just met a whole lot of people and said, um, I'm doing a doctorate, and, uh, and I want to literally become a raver, which is what I did um, for, um, for, for nearly four years in between studying... <laughs> In between studying some of the most difficult philosophy um, ever, uh, I had to take off my lecturer's clothes and don my army pants and dye my hair four colors um, and hang out with a whole bunch of strangers um, raving with them, literally. Um, and it's written in. My own experience is written in of being on ecstasy at the back. But the primary orientation of the whole book is 
putting the people at, at the forefront of knowledge. Um, is that what you're trying to get to, Joel? Yeah, yeah, just, uh, yeah, you kind of were giving a... Uh, I guess, you know, I, if you want to get your book, you're, you go through and look at all the different aspects of the ecstasy experience from all these different points of view. It's yep. a very rich, diverse group that yep. make up what you call ravers. Uh, uh, but you really, when in reading it, um, what I liked is that I really felt like I got to know, you know, a lot of the people uh, that really came through there. Yeah. The, the, the people had tremendous self-illumination into their own experiences. Um, it was, you know, I, I, when you're doing this, you really start from a point of ignorance, right? That's the starting point of the ethnography. Instead of going in going, I know what you are as a scientist, what the anthropologist does is says, I don't know anything about you at all. Um, and what I want to understand is you through you and what you're all doing together um, as you're out there on the dance floor you know, going for it, um, and all of the different aspects of their lives, including reintegrating into work, um, you know, how they would, um, you know, generate rituals. There's hundreds and hundreds of different examples, looking at every single aspect from movements of the eyes, salivation, sexual behavior. Um, often a lot of this stuff is completely sanitized from anthropology, so they won't actually look at any of it at all. Um, and it was very, very important in this approach to really be maximally open um, to the exploration of the experience. Um, the only thing I didn't look at was drug dealing. Um, and I just thought that would be, um, that'd be hard because the university ethics and everything was already very, very difficult to say the least. Yep. <laughs> That man, I completely agree with you. Um, I think it, it runs through all of the books. There's a whole lot of books reviewed at the back from the qualitative, uh, you know, sociological and, and different dimensions. Um, one of the, you know, thinkers that's not it's mentioned but that isn't given further elaboration is Alfred Schultz, very famous Austrian uh, phenomenologist, and he speaks of we experiences those moments in life where there is no just I and you in dialogue, and in between us is the world, we'll say in phenomenology, but at a point where we can all just sort of, and just, you know, and we're all there together and everyone's like, wow, you know, there's that real sense that there's no longer um, the atomization or, you know, the, the singular. Um, and it's, it's quite obvious that they really, they build the whole thing around that, from my understanding of the music, um, and the culture that goes with it. Um, but what I sort of thought in comparison to a lot of the other books written was that this wasn't all a kind of, you know, anarchic project of freedom against the state or anything. What I saw in asking a lot of the people was that there was no project of freedom politically, most importantly. And that's from me coming from a left-wing background um, who's trying to understand in capitalism what previously was sort of we're against the state, we'll occupy space, we'll, you know, feel free to open up our feelings in a society that says we're not allowed to do that. Why was that absent? And that, you know, really started to inform um, some of this book um, that I'm thinking as a, a, a Marxist and left-wing thinker in, in capitalism. But primarily, I thought most of the people were there, you know, really um, connecting friendships, um, genuine, so genuine. The people were so amazingly open and genuine, made long-term friendships with a number of them, um, and they really liked what was uh, the final result. So, yeah. It was a critical study, though. It was meant to be a critical study. So, yep. Hi. Hi. Yep. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Levinasian idea of being for the other. Okay. Um, but if you are, are you suggesting that Um, do you want to scream to just he, they can't hear up the back he said um, you know uh, uh, an ethic of being for the other yep Levinasian um, ethic it's not written in there um, but um, it's, it certainly does seem 
um, as, as you're describing there, that this really sort of communal efflorescence emerges. Um, and that, you know, is noted in the kind of empathic bonding, um, you know, that uh, MDMA can facilitate in certain situations. Um, but uh, I certainly didn't uh, make those uh, philosophical reflections. We're going to cut it. Thank you very much, um, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs>